Hello, this is video number four for Digestive System. And uh, in these videos, we're working through the different segments of the alimentary canal and talking about the main anatomical features and uh, what the main functions are. So last video, we talked about the oral cavity. In this video, I want to talk about the pharynx and the esophagus. So uh, starting with the pharynx, this is the throat. And you know, uh, this is partly part of the uh, pathways in common with the respiratory tract. So we talked about that in the last chapter. Um, for food passage, entry into the oral cavity, um, swallowing transfers it to the oropharynx. That's the middle segment of the pharynx. And then to the laryngopharynx. And that's where the air and food passageways diverge. Um, air goes into the larynx, food, drink goes into the esophagus. And the key separator there is the um, epiglottis, which covers the entryway into the um, larynx and leaves only the esophagus as the open pathway. Now, for all of the um, segments of the alimentary canal through which food is passing initially um, in which the food is in uh, it's somewhat homogenized but it still can be very abrasive depending on what the food is of course um, for all of those segments the mucosal epithelium so the innermost layer of cells lining the lumen is a stratified epithelium, stratified squamous epithelium. So that's from the mouth through all the way through the esophagus. When we get to the stomach, that's a transition. But for now, that's a stratified epithelium. And if you remember, stratified multiple layers, the um, layers, the apical layers, those that are um, lining the lumen in contact with the food, are um, meant to wear away. And the basal layers have dividing cells that are constantly replacing cells that are worn off through the passage of food. Okay, so stratified squamous epithelium is meant to, um, you know, endure the friction of food moving through. Um, and so the beginning of the digestive tract has that lining in the mucosal epithelium. Now for the pharynx, this segment of the alimentary canal is a little bit different from most other segments. So the pharynx has the mucosal membrane lining the tube, but unlike um, the smooth muscle layers found elsewhere, the pharynx actually has two layers of skeletal muscle. One layer has muscle fibers running longitudinally. That's the inner layer. And then the other layer has fibers that run around the pharynx. So uh, in swallowing, the ones that encircle the pharynx are the most important. And those are called the pharyngeal constrictor muscles. So let's take a look at um, how swallowing happens. And the technical term for this is deglutition. And on this slide, you can see it's broken down. Here's a woman eating an apple. The swallowing is broken down into three phases. First phase is voluntary. That's happening in the oral cavity. Second phase and third phase are involuntary. Once you start it, it happens automatically. Uh, second phase is the pharyngeal phase happening in the pharynx. Third phase is the esophageal phase happening in the esophagus. So the phases of deglutition start with phase one in the oral cavity. When you're chewing up food, mixing it with saliva, then at some point you push it to the back of the oral cavity with the tongue. The bolus is now positioned to swallow and it enters into the oropharynx. That leads to the second phase, the pharyngeal phase. And what happens in the pharyngeal phase is the uvula, the tip of the soft palate, gets pushed up against the back of the back wall of the pharynx. And that closes off the pathway 
into the nasal cavity. Likewise, down here, the epiglottis pivots when you swallow, covering entry into the larynx. So food now is going to travel down into the esophagus. Okay, so the first thing that happens is there is a um, sphincter muscle here uh, that's controlling entry into the esophagus. The sphincter muscle relaxes and that opens up the pathway for the bolus to enter into the esophagus. That leads to phase three, the esophageal phase, also involuntary. And once the food enters, uh, passes the superior esophageal sphincter, the sphincter closes and the bolus is now present in the upper esophagus. The esophagus mucosal epithelium secretes lots of mucus. So the esophagus is very well lubricated, right? Mucus is very slippery substance. Um, and also motility through the esophagus involves peristaltic contractions of the muscularis layer of the esophagus, okay? So motility in the pharynx is due to contraction of skeletal muscles, the pharyngeal constrictors. We'll have a slide showing those in a second. And then motility in the esophagus is by peristalsis due to the smooth muscle layers in the muscularis externa. Peristaltic contractions are gonna push the bolus down through the esophagus, and then that's gonna reach um, another sphincter called the gastroesophageal sphincter that's controlling entry into the stomach. All right, let's take a look at the pharyngeal constrictor muscles. So these are uh, three skeletal muscles. So the pharyngeal constrictors are arranged in superior, middle, and inferior. And they're basically surrounding the oro and the, the laryngopharynx. They're going to contract in order one, two, three, and that's going to be driving motility of the food that you swallow downward towards the esophagus. Okay, here is showing the oral cavity, the esophagus, and the pharynx, oro and laryngopharynx. So these are one, to three segments of the alimentary canal. It's also showing the superior esophageal sphincter, um, the inferior esophageal sphincter. This is also called the gastroesophageal sphincter, gastro for stomach, esophageal obviously for esophagus. Here's another structure. Um, in order to reach the stomach, the esophagus has to pass through an opening in the diaphragm. So this diaphragm is known as the esophageal hiatus, the opening, sorry, the opening is known as the esophageal hiatus. Okay, so that's passing through the diaphragm and then it's gonna lead into the stomach. All right, um, so <clears throat> this slide is showing a cross section through the esophagus. And on the left, we can see the four layers of the wall of the esophagus. Innermost is mucosa, and the epithelium in the esophagus is a stratified squamous epithelium. Still stratified here. That's going to change when we get to the stomach. In the empty esophagus, the mucosal membrane and the submucosal membrane collapse inward. And so the tube has this kind of collapsed appearance to it. When food passes through, it's going to stretch all this out. Okay, it's also showing the submucosa, areolar loose connective tissue supporting the epithelium. Showing the muscularis layers here. Here's an inner circular and an outer longitudinal layer. Oh, here's a longitudinal, sorry. Right, so the two layers of the muscularis, those are going to be generating contractions to um, push food through the esophagus. And then finally, the outermost wrapping on the esophagus is the adventitia, which is a fibrous connective tissue. All right, I mentioned before that there's a transition in the mucosal epithelium 
from the esophagus to the stomach. So the right side here shows a section, um, tissue section, in which we're looking at <clears throat> the mucosal epithelium of the esophagus. So as we're traveling down the esophagus, this is the stratified squamous epithelium. And then right here, when we get to the stomach, look at the transition, stratified squamous epithelium here, boom. Now it's a simple columnar epithelium. And this is what's lining the inside of the stomach. So you can see that very dramatic transition in the mucosal epithelium. All right, this slide is showing the gastroesophageal sphincter. And um, here is a bolus coming down, ready to enter into the stomach. When that happens, this sphincter relaxes, opens the pathway for peristaltic contractions to push this bolus into the lumen of the stomach. Stomach is a relatively wide uh, pathway. So um, it basically is gonna plop into the stomach and it's gonna mix with um, secretions from the stomach wall. A couple of terms I wanna point out, a hiatal hernia. So let me go back to this slide. There's the hiatus, the opening in the diaphragm. Occasionally what can happen is the stomach can poke up through this and um, if there's sufficient pressure, it's gonna, part of the stomach will be above the diaphragm. That's a hiatal hernia. How, what happens to cause a hiatal hernia? So one thing is overeating. Uh, if you overeat Thanksgiving dinner, um, the stomach is a temporary storage place and the stomach gets really large, it expands. And uh, it might expand to the point of pushing through the hiatus. So that could cause a hiatal hernia. Uh, another term is reflux, gastric reflux. So after the sphincter uh, opens to allow the bolus through, typically it closes. However, um, in gastric reflux, there is movement of the stomach acid. The secretions are very acidic here um, through the sphincter back into the esophagus. That causes a lot of irritation. The wall of the stomach is meant to resist stomach acid the wall of the esophagus is not. So that's what gastric reflux is. This irritation produces a kind of burning sensation. And the uh, location of the hiatus to the heart, heart would be right about here, very close. The sensation you get from reflux is very close to the heart and that's why it's called heartburn. So heartburn is just due to this splashback of stomach acid into the esophagus. And there's a whole uh, disease called gastroesophageal reflux, reflux disease. If this is a chronic condition, so sometimes the sphincter in some people doesn't always uh, properly close. Um, and this kind of disease can result chronic gastric reflux. Okay. So I'm going to stop the video here and the next video we'll talk about the stomach. See ya.